Well, tonight is um, another one of our question and answer services, and before I start the microphone part, uh, sometimes some of the best questions are the ones that after the service people come up and they say, I am too shy, embarrassed, and unable to stand in front of that mic. So just answer it for me right here. And so that was last uh, Sunday night, right after the service. And so, and I didn't even speak last night, it was, uh, or last Sunday, it was the Word of Life team. And uh, the question was, um, actually, what they said actually was, is heaven only bowing down around the throne? That's all you talk about. That wasn't a question, really. And I said, and what's the question? He said, what will we be doing in heaven? Only bowing down around the throne? And, and I guess what it is is um, that, that there's just been so much talk about heaven and all these multicolors and all these people coming and going from heaven that it's just peaked uh, within uh, many of us what we do in heaven. So then they said, does the Bible explain other activities? And so what I said to them in the front was, this is what is uh, almost every time heaven is portrayed. This is how it's portrayed. But there's a lot more in heaven. So what I did, I, this is what I told them, but you know, the longer you give me to think about something, it gets longer. But uh, so I'll just run through it real quick and then we'll go to the microphones. God's word presents at least five distinct, now I said at least, I mean I'm just standing there in front uh, actually, uh, when I had to write my dissertation at Dallas Seminary on heaven, it was much more than five. But number one, heaven is a place where everything that's good and perfect actually originates. And I think we need to recalibrate. Uh, we don't need um, all of these addendums to what God has already told us. Everything that is good and perfect means all the amazing sensations of our human lives. God is the one, by the way, that designed us, thought all this stuff up. Our sight, our smell, our taste, our touch, our emotions, the way we think, how we remember. Anticipation. Did you know anticipation and reminiscence are two of the most powerful gifts God has given us? I, I know because I take people on trips and I, and I anticipate with them and then when they come back they reminisce. And it's, it, it, think about that all the way through life and that's something God designed. And all activities are at their supreme level in heaven. Think of the sense of sight where you don't, you know, need glasses and and laser surgery and cataract surgery and drops. Can you imagine just having a sense of sight and smell in perfect form, of taste and touch, the same. Of all the delights of anticipation and reminiscence, none of that will go away in heaven. Secondly, heaven is a place where Jesus said, real life finally begins. Now you talk to most people, and, and if things are going well, and they have enough money, and they're healthy, and, and everything, they think they're really living. You ever heard that? Boy, we're really living now. Heaven, Jesus said, is when real life finally begins. If you think any part of this life is good, you have no idea how good it can be if, if you, you come to the Lord and experience this. That means any of the joys, delights, and pleasures of this life that are good. See, God is only going to perpetuate the, the unfallen, unsinful. But did you know, you know, I mean, for a believer, about 99% of everything available in the world is Wonderful. There's only a very small part. There was only one thing in the whole garden that Eve was supposed to stay away from. And of course, like I said this morning, that's where we go first, right? But anything in life that's good will be magnified in heaven. Anything you will ever experience, enjoy, share, and treasure in life that was good, anything, will be best in heaven. You know, most people think that what God wants to do is uh, just make us all uh, you know, just kind of be like the stereotypical uh, 17th century Puritan. And I'm not opposed to him. I love the Puritan prayers and everything. But you know, the dark clothing, dour, somber. That, I, I, we're supposed to be very serious. And Jesus was meek and lowly. But God is the God of wonder. 
And if you know anything about the Jewish form of worship, uh, I love, that's why I guess I, 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 I would move to Jerusalem if I could and live there because I just love seeing, even in their fallen blindness, how exuberant those people are. They, they have zeal without knowledge, as, as uh, Paul says. And, and they are zealous in their worship of the God that many of them don't even know. They know about him, but they don't know him. And, and, uh, but everything in heaven will be best. Never forget, Jesus created all these amazing pleasures in life. Humans did not think up the pleasures of life. God designed them, every one of them. Uh, and here's another one. Heaven is a place that is always portrayed as surrounding a huge happy banquet of feasting on food and drinks and unhurriedly surrounded by friends. All the best pleasures on earth are perfected and magnified in heaven for us, the redeemed. Just as, now think about this, all of the worst evils of earth will be endlessly magnified for the lost. God gives everybody what they really want. Really. Think about it. I mean, you, you can act one way, but down deep all of us really want certain things. And those really are the drivers of our life. And for those who want uh, you know, to, to be pursuing things that God says are evil and wicked and sinful, they will forever be wanting those things and never be satisfied. Have you ever seen someone detoxing or, you know, going through, you know, rehab for alcohol, for anything like that? I mean, well, you've probably seen it portrayed on television, you know, the, the, all of the contortions and vomiting and, you know, being sick. I mean, I remember uh, what was the Johnny Cash movie, you know, the Ring of Fire one, you know, and how he was just all like that. Think of all the people in hell that are going to endlessly be increasing in their desires and increasingly being dissatisfied. Hell is the worst evils endlessly magnified for the lost as, as they're all those passions and desires, the Lord doesn't take away. They, they don't be, they're not taken away. They're, hell is called an unsatisfied, just like, uh, you know, it's just never satisfied. We will be endlessly satisfied. That's why the banquet idea, and, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, what it means. Fourthly, by the way, this is just the, these are just the points. I haven't gotten to the message. Heaven is a place where everyone that has ever invested our time and talents and treasure into either directly or indirectly will be seeking us out. Did you know that? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about, yeah, every day I have two choices. I mean, I can just be posting endlessly on my Facebook page and taking a picture of everything I can think of in the world and, and, and just spending all of my time in amusements and things I love, or I can do what most people least like to do, and that is walk up to people I don't know and could be rejected, and I can keep trying to share the gospel. Let me ask you in heaven, do you think anybody's going to come to you in heaven and ask you about your Instagram account and how many twits or tweets or whatever pokes you did in your life? No, but the Bible says that every single person that you and I invested our life into on earth for Christ will be seeking us out and welcoming us by inviting us into their rooms in our Father's house. And I didn't get this by getting my head bumped, you know, and getting an out-of-body. It's actually in the Bible. See, that's how most people don't even know it's in the Bible because they've spent so much time, you know, trying to hear f fantasies. To share what the Lord did through us in their lives. This is such a big dimension of heaven. What God used us fallen, frail, sinful, weak people to accomplish for his glory. That means as we daily surrender to Christ, living his life through us, and we pray for people, we teach people, we lead people to Christ, we disciple people, we support people in ministry, we help them through their life struggles, we encourage them in the word or even getting in the word, and we sorrow and sympathize with them, plus all whose lives they touch onward for the Lord. All that comes back to touch us with the delightful joy. It's endless. I remember, um, let's see if I remember how Phil taught me to do this. There we go. I remember, uh, I don't know how to do it because I haven't done it since the 70s, but it was something like this, and then this, and then this. This is Amway, by the way. Did you ever think you'd get an Amway show here? 
I mean, I sat in, in uh, Roger, Charlie Marsh, and uh, what? I don't even remember all their names. All the biggies in the 70s, in the 60s, actually. I, I sat and, and listened to them do this, Charlie Marsh and everything. What they said is, this is you, and if you would just find two people to buy the Amway kit for $35 back then, and they each find two to buy the Amway kit, and if they just buy a little soap for their washing machine and con some off on their grandmother, and you know what I mean, and sell it at work, and if they will, you all know this, that you will get some percent off this thing, and you know, I think it was 35%, and then you get, I don't know what on that, and I don't remember what on this, but the big one was that you would get one quarter, now I know it's all changed, but one quarter of 1% of all that. And there was a lady named Esther, or no, Kraus was their name, Kraus. She was one of the original herbal, or uh, Neutralite, I don't remember. But Kraus up here was one of like the two people that Jay Van Adel started. And when Amway got to like $40 million, Mrs. Kraus was making one-fourth of 1% 1 of it all. And that was the paragon, that, that the higher up the pyramid you were, or it's not a pyramid, it was, it, it's a legitimate thing, and they were really working. But what it was saying is, that Mrs. Krauss might have only, Bernice, I think her name was, only got this far in the process, and 40 years of Amway just blew it out to whatever it's in the billions now. She's still getting now of 12 billion. It's a lot of money. That communicated to people. And I remember almost every American airline pilot in the 70s was in Amway. And they were, everybody was in Amway. And everybody was thinking of what would happen now. Everyone, everyone that, that we, as we're surrendered to Christ living his life through us, that we pray for and teach and lead to Christ and disciple and support in ministry and help through life struggles, and, and I could go on and on with that, what that means is that, that if you invest in, you know, Frank and Karen Mills over here, and they're off in, you know, Romania, and there some little kid gets saved, and he goes off to Croatia and, and leads a thousand people to the Lord, guess who knows better than Amway your connection to that? You understand? Do you understand the, the spiritual accounting that God is doing? And I'll show you in just a minute where it says that in the Bible, but I was just introducing this. And finally, here's the last point. God's word presents another distinct dimension of heaven. I'm only covering the ones that I covered last week. So, um, Heaven is finally a place of the throne, falling down before God, joining everyone in the universe together in worship of his greatness and glory. And that's what the questioner said. Is that all? I said, no. That is what is most portrayed in the scriptures. But it's not the only element we're taught as a part of our eternal home. So real quickly, so we aren't here too long. Think deeply about what you know already and apply it to heaven, okay? First of all, here's a verse. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above. Anything good and perfect in life, whether it's the joys of parenting, whether it's the joys of helping people, whether it's the joys of meeting the needs of a needy, whether it's the joy of, of stepping back and, and watching all the glory go to the Lord, whatever is good and perfect in life comes down from the Father of lights. Everything good comes from God. So that's what I mean by this. Everything that's good and perfect in life actually originated with God. Do you think it's wonderful to see creation? Uh, do you think it's wonderful to the varieties of smells? Did you know if you want to be challenged, um, uh, Brandon Yancey, the Fearfully Wonderfully Made book, it talks about how our sense of smell can detect one particle, uh, you know, a micron-sized particle of something out of gazillions of particles, and that one particle 
going through our olfactory system will hit a synaptic connection and go all the way to our brain, and you will remember your grandmother's muffins that you haven't thought about for 30 years. And the sense of smell is so powerfully connected with experience, experiences in the past, with everything in between. And see, it, to think that that evolved, how did it evolve, you know? Every one of these, our senses and, and the, the, the elements of our humanness, God gave all those to us. Now, we've corrupted them a lot of ways. And I mean, I could go on and taste and touch and emotion and thought and memory and all the others. But anything that's good in life, about how we are, how we're designed, anything, the Lord designed it. Today, we only partially taste the joys of heaven. What are the good and perfect joys of life? Here are a few to think me about with me about and as we do remember this the best the brightest the most beautiful parts of every dimension of our earthly life will be exponentially you know that's to the power of exponentially immeasurably more so in heaven that's why in just a moment we'll get to the next verse Jesus said when you enter life you know what he said we're not really even living now we're like zombies to use a movie term compared to what life is like in heaven and see that's why the devil is so dead set on obfuscating what's really going on and that's why we are bound in our sinfulness and darkness and blindness because if we really knew did you remember what Paul said Paul did have an out of body only his, he went to heaven the Lord took him and showed him and he says, what I've seen is unlawful to be uttered. Why? Because everybody would have wanted to die that night. That nobody would have wanted to stay here on earth. That's why he says, I would rather be in heaven, but it's needful for me to stay. If we really knew what it means that the best of anything, far more than, I mean, God has only revealed so, so minute amount to us because we have so little capacity to even understand. But, but just what we've seen is so nice. People are willing to do anything to get it. I mean, the beauties and joy and travel and experiences and everything, they're willing to spend their whole life just to get that. And they don't realize that they're down uh, in the twilight zone and they're not even alive compared to what God has prepared for us. So the best, the brightest, the most beautiful parts of every dimension of our earthly life. There's not one dimension that we experience that God hasn't designed. It's just we have, in our fallenness, have twisted it. But everything, I mean, for everybody that's, you know, under whatever age, uh, guess who designed this? Wow, de do Do you think the devil designed sex? Are you kidding? Why does God talk about heaven like being married? that we're engaged and we're going to our wedding night is heaven. That's supposed to conjure up an idea of, well, it doesn't anymore because everybody nowadays, you know, sex is so demeaned and commercialized and debased. But I'm talking about unsaved people and gradually with saved people. God portrays heaven as us being engaged and going to a wedding banquet and to begin an endless, what would be called a honeymoon in heaven. It's amazing to think about that. As uh, C.S. Lewis said, you know, we're content making mud pies in the alley when he's invited us to a beach resort in heaven forever. Okay, so just think about, and I just, I told you the longer I think, I, I mean, just think of everything with what God's given us. All the amazing, endless variations of our taste, all those things, you know. I was hungry when I was writing this, you know, and I was smelling. You can tell when I wrote this, Bonnie was cooking, you know, perfectly prepared beef. She made these New York uh, strips and, and, you know, citrusy, perfectly done fish. I was really getting hungry, corn souffles. All of those are the wonders of taste. See how each of them lights up a memory. I mean, if I say chocolate cake or cranberry orange sauce or creamy Italian or basso, it immediately in your mind, you know, hints of cilantro, whatever, it just, look at this. Each of them lights up a memory path of synaptic connections. There are, there are uh, more synaptic neural connections in our mind than there are stars in the universe. Did you know that? It's interesting to think about. And God designed that for what? For us to sit on a cloud 
like a Puritan? You know what I mean? No. No, and I'm not making fun of them, but you know what I mean. You've seen the pictures. The best, the brightest, the most beautiful of every dimension is going to be in heaven. Think about smell. You can go through this, and I already told you about that. I mean, I, I thought of every smell, and, and God designed that. I mean, do you think we're not going to smell in heaven? I mean, there are trees bearing fruit. Everything on earth that was good is going to be in heaven in some form that's going to be exponentially better. It's interesting. Um, sight. God loves, I mean, just look how he describes heaven. John could not, and Ezekiel, and Moses, and Exodus, and, you know, everybody that's writing, and Daniel, everybody that's writing about heaven, they couldn't figure out how to describe it. I mean, it was streets of gold, but you could see through them. You know, clear as crystal. Even the glassy sea that reflects and refracts, and then the you know, it's kind of like uh, a Telsa, you know, whatever those are called, where the lightning's going like this. Uh, that's what the throne of God is like? I mean, do you think that the God who made a world of sunsets and storms and softly falling huge flakes of snow, which, yay, or daffodils bursting out and all of the colors and, and everything, the wonders of sight, everything we see connects in our minds. God created it for our pleasure. And heaven is going to be exponentially, immeasurably more than that. If you study the doctrine of God, God can endlessly reveal more to us. He'll never run out. He is infinite. And we are finite. And we can just keep pursuing forever and we'll never get near the end of God. Who would trade that for being an unrepentant sinner who will never be able to enter the kingdom of God? See, I think that we don't need any more movies. We just need to tell people what the Bible says. Uh, doing. Think about the things we can do. We can write and think and plan and learn, and we can cook and bake and sew and craft and, and ski and swim and surf and skate and go hunting and fishing and camping and enjoy painting and woodworking and building and drawing. And how about designing and programming and collecting and studying? And add to that the wonders of discovering and traveling and exploring and experiencing. All of those wonders of doing. Do you think God's going to shut all that down? Do you think about everything the Bible says about what everything good and perfect came from above? And, and we are endlessly, I think that the throne times are when we all just get back and just can't wait to do what we sang tonight, how great is our God. And, and we'll just be overflowing uh, and the Lord will be uh, glorified. Second, Jesus said this is where real life finally begins. I'm going to show you the verse. Uh, Anything you will ever experience and share and treasure in life that was good, the best of it will be in heaven. Uh, life with God will be of a such greater magnitude that anything we are aware of or experienced on earth, that it will seem in comparison that we weren't even alive. You know, we will have memory in heaven. Did you know that? We have memory. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? He remembered his family. He remembered Lazarus. He remembered what he did. He remembered how much food he had. Do you realize we remember now God's going to divinely edit out all the sin, the, the record of sin, the, the pain and the, but not the fact that we sinned. That isn't going to be removed, but it's going to be the sting. Remember, Paul could talk about murdering and being the chiefest of sinners, and he glorified God because it meant how much he'd been forgiven of. And so it's not like we're going to forget how bad we were, but it's going to be transformed into how great God is to forgive us that much. We'll finally see how much he forgave us for, <laughs> and we'll be amazed. But Turn to Matthew 18. In fact, you ought to turn your Bibles. You guys will just be spectators. But some of these you should mark so that you can talk to people about this. These two are great. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 18. Now, he started saying this in Matthew 5 when he talks about, uh, you know, if you look at a woman, it's the same as committing adultery. If you hate, it's just like murder. Do you remember when he was talking about the radical steps we need to take? Sin is so bad that we don't play with it. We don't get as close as possible to it. We take radical measures to, to avoid sin. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. Now listen to this. I mean, most people don't like that part and it's bothersome. So they don't keep, don't keep really deeply thinking what Jesus is saying. 
it is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed. What he's saying is, go from this world to God's presence, lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now, he's making a strong contrast here between the saved and the lost. Did you catch what he said, though? Enter into life. What he's saying is, compared to what you're going through right now, it's like you're not there yet. It's like you're still inside the womb. You know, you're kicking and, and starting to, you know, move around and sense things, but you don't even know what's out there yet. You, you really aren't into life. I mean, you've got a great taste, and you know me, the Lord says. He says it again in verse 9, enter into life. Uh, what he's saying is that, that, that where we're headed and what it's like around his throne is like Paul said. He says it is just inexpressible. I can't really tell you. I can tell you what the Bible says. I'm not going to tell you any more. Matthew 25. This is really interesting. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Look at this. This is how Jesus describes heaven. The joy of your Lord. That's why the around the throne part isn't really bad. I mean, if you think it sounds boring, you don't really understand God because the highest pursuit of our life is to remember the Westminster Catechism, is to glorify God. And if we really understood that, then we wouldn't want to go on any trips and explore and taste and smell and anticipate and reminisce. We just want to be there. And we will be wanting to be there. And God's going to throw in everything else. But Jesus described heaven as the joy of your Lord. But, but look at also in heaven. What is that? I, by how you operated with what I gave you on earth, I'm going to let you rule over many things. People go, what are you going to rule over? Do you think God has limits? I mean, he, he is watching. It, it's very interesting to think about what's going on here. God is above you know, up here, uh, I always call it the ant farm, you know, God is looking down at us and he is watching uh, what he gave us. Each of us are here and he gave us our, our little area and he's watching what, you know, whether we're doubling or, you know, quadrupling or hiding, you know, what he gave us. And he's watching what we do. This is, this is in our earthly life and this is in our eternal life. And what God says is, Okay, I gave you speaking and serving gifts and you, you worked at, you know, 30-fold. Then you're going to start here in heaven, you know, at a 30-fold rate in heaven. See, what we do on earth is how we're going to begin in heaven. You notice he says that. He says, in proportion that you were good and faithful over a few things, I'm going to, I'm going to, increase those for you and you're going to have the joy of continuing to serve me in heaven. And he says it all the way through. Uh, you can read this. So basically what the Lord is saying is that there is, there is a reciprocity between here and there. And for those, those who, you know, hide their treasures have a bad ending. They get thrown out. So probably they're not saved. But those who do very little, it says they're saved, yet so as by fire, and they sorrow. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. There's another dimension here, suffering. Suffering, in fact, I was just in the hospital uh, reading this to one of our dear saints, uh, Phil Schmidt. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 says that to the degree that we suffer, increases in heaven our capacity to worship. Did you know that? Most of us run from suffering. If we realized that our light momentary tribulations work in exceeding, our suffering on earth is light and momentary. 
that's how God describes the worst, the worst it can be here, you know? It's light compared to hell, it's light. It's momentary compared to eternity, it's momentary. But in heaven, it works in exceeding and an eternal weight of glory. Did you know who some of the greatest people are going to be in heaven? You probably never heard of them. They persisted in loving and worshiping and serving God. In handicap, weak, I mean, look at some of our greatest hymn writers of past generations. Before they all became superstars and performers, they used to be sick, blind, helpless, weak people. Fanny Crosby. All of these people, how many of them wrote hymns from sickness, weakness, blindness, poverty, and everything else? And what they were doing is they were experiencing limitations and, you know, a lot of them uh, had all kinds of struggles in life and didn't live very long. And all of that suffering was increasing their capacity for worship and, and giving them an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why do you think the man after God's own heart was one of the most depressive kind of people you've ever met? David. David was very much a minor key person. I mean, he danced with his tambourines now and then, but that wasn't, I don't think that was his norm. And, and part of that is that the Lord has a whole different way of measuring stuff, but I'm getting off the page. Third, heaven is a place that's always portrayed as surrounding a huge happy banquet. And, and think about this. For the vast, in this part you haven't thought about, for the vast majority of the people in the Bible times, life was a constant lifelong struggle. I just read a piece that's so interesting on what you and I are going home to tonight. We all have running water that's heated. We all have something of some kind to cook with. We all have some type of cooling system so we can have food that, that we don't have to go and kill and, and pluck and, you know, and get ready for that meal. And, and we don't have to grind it unless we want to, you know, the grain. And, and I just read a piece that talked about how many servants it took in the old world to have light in the house, heat in the house, water in the house, water of various temperatures in the house, water to be poured over us while we bathe. Do you realize getting in a shower, do you know how hard that was in the ancient world? You had to have several slaves that were going and dumping water on you and they were out back chopping wood and, and heating it and bringing it and going from the, wherever they got it from while a whole bunch of other slaves were cooking and doing all this stuff. And, and we come home and poke the microwave button and don't realize that for the mass, vast majority of everybody in the Bible times, life was a constant, lifelong struggle, and we complain? Have you ever noticed how less the attendance is here when it rains? We don't want to get wet. How about when, you know what I mean? If you can't find a close parking space, it's, it's a hardship. These people, life was a struggle to work to get enough to eat and drink, to even find a place of shelter, to rest. I mean, you're, you did not have asphalt shingles back then. Remember, a, a bad wife was like a constant dripping. They knew what that meant. Their roofs leaked. And, and I mean, you talk about the way they lived. And, and they, their clothes to wear, I mean, they had to kill them or cut it or grow it to make it. And, and it was hard. And the idea of not working and instead being served a banquet? Do you see this? We've lost so much. We have too many, um, what's it called across the street up there? You know, the gourmet or the buffet place, you know? We have too many of those in life. So banquet has dropped. The idea of of served at a banquet was almost the greatest possible dream for a normal person. Everything provided, your food was there, it was in a comfortable, well-lit, sheltered place, you were given a, a robe. Remember, when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to put a robe and walk us up and introduce us to God. Now, this is how Jesus describes where we're going. Look at this, Matthew eight eleven, And I say to you, Jesus is presenting the gospel, and he says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west. See, he was talking about the gospel going global and it was going to transcend, as God always intended, the Jewish people. It was going to widen out. And he says people from all over the world are going to come and see this sit-down thing? This is the banquet 
motif, it's called. Uh, look what getting to heaven is called for us believers in Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, Jesus goes on in Matthew and says, the kingdom of heaven, uh, talking about God's rule and his reign and his righteousness and our salvation, is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. See that, that idea of marriage? And then Luke goes on and says, you can eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on my thrones. He's talking to the, to the disciples right then, the 12 specifically, because the 12 are going to sit on thrones and judge the 12 tribes. There's another dimension of what's going on in heaven. This is probably millennial, uh, the, the uh, earthly kingdom of Christ. But whatever, heaven is talked about as a banquet, sitting down, uh, having everything in abundance. But it doesn't end there. It's also, the scriptures use the family joys of a wedding banquet where all cares are forgotten, all work is set aside. Remember how they used to do weddings? It was a week-long celebration. Every moment is focused on celebrating, satisfying food and drink, spending time with everyone that really matters in life. That's what back then a wedding was. Everybody came in, all of your neighbors and friends and relatives. I mean, you just spent your fortune because it was the most glorious time. That's what a wedding banquet was, and that's what heaven is described as. God has paid the highest price to get us there and to provide this. And ideally, a wedding banquet portrays almost the highest of imaginable joys. Remember, the primary interpretation of the Bible is what did God mean when he talked to the people that directly received it the first time? That's the first canon of textual interpretation. If he said heaven is like a banquet, you know what they thought about? They thought about what everybody, I mean, longed for. That's why when the wine ran out in John 2, it was like the ultimate disaster because everything was about making this the best. And what Jesus said heaven is, God the ultimate host, has gone to absolutely the highest expense to make heaven, portraying the highest of imaginable joys. That's how God wants us to think about heaven, not about whether the horses are purple and they're unicorns. If he doesn't talk about it, it's not important, okay? And it doesn't deserve uh, time. Fourthly, heaven is a place where everyone we've ever invested our time and talents and treasure into, either directly or indirectly, will be seeking us out. I don't know if we've thought about this enough. If we did, it would change everything. I mean, who wants to have the iPhone 12, you know, and pay the extra whatever, or whatever it's on, if you could have the iPhone 3 and have extra money to have people that will forever, I mean, you can only impress people so long, you know, with this. And then it's dud. You've got to have a better one. Think of this. Think of this because Jesus portrayed money as dangerous. In fact, the best way I could illustrate money is money is like a radioactive substance. And if it's not encased carefully, and if it's not controlled, and if it's not directed in the right way, it's absolutely dangerous. Money, if it's not encased with what God says that we are to do with our money, it pierces us through like radiation. How many people do you know that love money so much that they deny their responsibilities to the Lord, to their family, to his calling and everything else because they believe that the goal of life is to get as much of this radiation as possible and it's shriveling their soul while they're doing it. That's, God always talks about money either negatively or neutral and, and never positive unless it's encased with, with his eternal principles about the purpose of money. And so, so think about what money is for. Everyone we've invested, and by the way, more than our money, money is just distilled time. If you think about it, either yours or somebody else's. Either your grandparents made it all or you did or someone gave it to you. 
So we have time that's distilled into money. And then we have the, the giftedness God has given us. And he is watching us through life to see how we invest those things, either directly or indirectly. And the people that it ends up touching, that's what you really have to watch for, is what is the actual touch that, that the investment's going to make, will welcome us by inviting us into their rooms in our Father's house. Do you ever wonder why heaven is portrayed as this big complex of homes? It's our Father's house, and we all have these rooms. In fact, the word in John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions, that word is actually, when it's translated in the Septuagint, it's the word for the nests of the animals in the ark. It's like heaven's one big ark, and we're all in it, and we all have our little nests. And we're going from nest to nest, not like the one that, with the smoke that they just did from Hollywood. <laughs> but uh, I don't like that one. Um, to share what the Lord did through us in their lives. And it's going to be endless. That means we're daily, as we surrender and pray for people, uh, that, I mean, the longer your prayer list, it, do you realize every prayer we make, God collects, keeps it right in front of him. Every prayer we offer, he's got it right there. That is the closest thing. You want to get close to God better than, than, than uh, you know, a lot of the mechanics we go through today. Prayer catapults us to the bowls right at the foot of his throne of grace and mercy, and we find him responding. Uh, the people we teach, the people we lead to Christ, we take them with us to heaven. The ones we disciple, we fulfill what we were called for. People we support in ministry, people that supported Paul, he told them, your gift is accruing to your account. Now we're back to the Amway thing. Can you imagine investing in Paul better than Google? You know what I mean? Can you imagine that, that everything Paul did? Here's Paul. And he ceaselessly, for a generation, started churches all across the ancient Roman world from end to end. And all of those people took the gospel out like this. And they're coming down to most of us today in Michigan are probably somehow a byproduct of the Gentile ministry that Paul began. And that means that the people in Philippi that sent once and again to Paul, Philippians 4, a sweet-smelling offering you provided. Paul said, your gift and the ministry I accomplished is accruing to your account, Philippians. God is keeping a record of what you supporting me so I could lead them to Christ and train them to be church planners and you prayed for me. I mean, you can just do the math yourself. So, all of that. Now, let's go to the dimension in Luke. Here we go. Here's the, look at this. Oh, come on. Where's the verse? Well, let's just turn there. Luke 16, I don't know how come I didn't get it. So, we don't have a slide for it. Let's look at Luke 16. So, I don't have any of these things. Now we'll have to go back to the front of the church uh, last Sunday night because this is what I was talking about. Look at Luke 16 and look at what Jesus says. Th this is just an amazing, how Jesus uh, tells, he's telling the story about this unjust steward in Luke 16, 1. And he says, there's a rich man, he had a steward, and da-da-da-da. And he called in verse 5 all the debtors and told them to change everything. And you know what I would think the Lord would go into? He'd be talking about being an honest businessman. That's not, I mean, he doesn't condone this guy's uh, misappropriation of his master's assets. But he used, after he got everybody's attention with this story, and you ought to read this story over and over and over, it's one of the most fascinating motivators. But look what happens in verse 9. So we're in Luke 16 and verse 9. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Remember I told you that God is very cautious. God is not positive about money. Money is dangerous. It's radioactive. It destroys. The Puritans said, for every 99 that can endure adversity, 
Only one can endure prosperity. See, I do like the Puritans. They were wise. You send sickness and weakness and struggles and hardships. For most people, it makes them trust the Lord, love the Lord more, seek him more. People pray for them. They get encouraged. You send someone $648 million a Powerball, and their life, check it out, is destroyed. Check out the lives of the people that win the lottery. Destructive. Horror. I mean, they'll try and give you know, $20 million to the church, hoping that'll help. People cannot, few people can take prosperity. It, it makes our hearts cold. It makes us think that we don't need God. It makes us start to look down on people. It's, we're scared someone's going to take it from us. We want to enjoy it all. And, you know, it just it brings out the worst parts in us. So, Luke 16, 9. Here's what God says. Now, he said, this is what you should do with money. Make friends for yourselves with your money that when you, actually when your, your finances fail like this guy, remember this steward, his job was over and he was thinking about after his job. So the Lord says, think about your money, what you're going to do with it. This is in life, we have this money. This is in eternity. And what the Lord is saying here, this is the most fascinating thing. He said, did you know that you can take this money that, come on, this money, come on. Maybe I'm not going to be able to erase it. That's not pot, there we go. That, that is at best neutral and probably negative. But if you send it for purposes over here, that's what it means about uh, make friends by your unrighteous mammon, that when it fails, what does the next word say? They. Now we've, you don't call money they. That's a pronoun, a personal pronoun. They, we're talking about not it. We're talking about people here. This story is transmuting money into people, and they, look what they will do. They will receive you into an everlasting home. Do you think money, money can take me to an everlasting home? That's Catholicism. That's, that's cults. That's not the Bible. Money doesn't take me to an everlasting home. But money invested, now look back at the connection, that, that money that, that we use directly or indirectly, seeking out or, or ministering these people, leading them to Christ and training and discipling them and sending people like Paul to them and being like Christ and, and actually going after some ourselves. When we do that, those people are going to be right here in verse 9. They're going to be seeking us out. If you think about what this means, it means that they're going to come back to us and tell us what happened. I mean, think about with Paul. Um, just think about the Philippians investment and there's someone down here in the 11th century and they're going to come to the room of the person from the 1st century Philippi church that invested in Paul and they're going to say, did you know what? Well, Paul went on that trip to Spain and when he went on that trip to Spain, he led this person to the Lord and that person actually led this person to the Lord and they live right over there, by the way, and that person led this person to the Lord and you know what? That person came and my great-grandmother, who's over there? Uh, you know, they're going to connect all of that. Do you understand in heaven, we will be known as we're now known? God knows all the connections because he's already seen the beginning to the end. And in heaven, God is going to connect all of the pieces right down to how we got saved. I mean, I was led to the Lord by my mom who was led to the Lord by Holman Johnson, you know, the founder of Camp Barakel, who was led to the Lord by somebody in Illinois, who was led to the Lord from some camp meeting. And you talk about, you know, people do their genealogy. You do your spiritual genealogy sometime. Who led you to the Lord? Who, how did they come? Because that's part of what heaven, that's a little taste of heaven, how God orchestrates us coming to faith. Well, I could go on this all night, so finally... Heaven is a place of the throne falling down before God. And imagine as you're 
You know, the, the Muslims, when I teach over in uh, Jordan, the converted Muslim background believers tell me that when they're in the mosque and they all get down, that they actually are talking to each other. You know, the, they just go through the motions, but they're all talking and saying, hey, what, what movie are you going to next week? And can you want to come to my house for lunch, you know? They really do. They tell me all these stories. Can you imagine when we're around the throne? I'm not making fun of them. It's true. They do. Uh, when we're around the throne... We're with people that gradually we're coming to know everyone that God, by his grace and mercy, saved. We're finally seeing the connection of how they were a part of how God used them in my life and how I used them, or God used me in their life and all that. And this, which is most portrayed in the scripture, is not the only element we're talking about, all the throne time. That's why what, everything we've heard and thought about it's just the central feature in heaven. But the best, the brightest, the most beautiful parts of every dimension of our earthly life will be exponentially, immeasurably more in heaven. Life with God will be of a greater magnitude than anything we are aware of or experienced on earth. That it will seem in comparison we weren't even alive compared to our first taste of heaven. The scriptures most use the family joys of a wedding banquet where all cares are forgotten, all work set aside, and every moment is focused on celebration, satisfying things, and spending time with everyone that really matters to us in life. Ideally, a wedding banquet portrays almost the highest imaginable joy, and that's how God wished for us to think of heaven. And so I would encourage you to get to know heaven the way God describes it, because it's so good that uh, Paul said, if you really knew about it, you'd want to go right now. And most people don't want to go right now. They'll do anything to stay. Okay, you've been sitting so long, let's all stand, and uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to welcome these 10 wonderful new saints uh, into the membership here at Calvary. But let's bow together. Father, I pray that we would be overwhelmed at your love that you sent your only begotten son so that we would not perish and eternally be unsatisfied in the blackness of darkness feeling your endless wrath upon our sin and the debt we owe but that we get to actually sit down at an endless banquet with you, married as your beloved to you on our honeymoon forever, never growing old, never getting tired, never getting bored, only increasing in our capacity to love and adore and be in wonder at how great is our God. I pray that we would be thinking more of your greatness and what you've prepared that place for us and look forward to when you come to take us to that place that you've prepared for us. And thank you that while we're here, you've told us clearly what you want us to do. And I pray that we would think more and more about how to invest in those people we're going to spend forever being invited over to hear about how you, oh God, used us to touch them. And we'll thank you and thank you even for these new members you've sent to our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen.